because today we're going to get into the modeling side of it. So the past three parts we've just introduced a little bit to the concept of it, and we were looking at some of the equipment for it. And we got started a little bit with the modeling yesterday, so I'll, I'll recap from that point and then go on. Um, before I do that, I just, I just want to say it's important at this point, at this time of the year, with the course loads that you had, that you guys keep up with the material. I recognize that there's so many other competing constraints with about four or five of the other courses that I've been made aware of. So I, I recognize that there's, there's incredible stress. So time management is critical at this time of the year. Um, if you're not keeping up with this material, you must make the time to, to keep up with it because these uh, classes we've looked in the past two classes and in today's class are going to be used in the next, next few classes. So I, I guess speaking to you guys, it's not really important. It's more to people who are watching the video at home that you guys keep up with um, The other thing is because of all this uh, tremendous amount of activity with your other courses, I am considering assignment five to be optional. However, what I will do is then just say I will hand out assignment five, it will be due as a regular assignment. Um, it's optional though, so what I'll end up doing is if you hand in assignment five, we'll grade, we'll grade it, return it, and then the grade that you'll get for the assignment components of the course will be the best of four assignments. So if you had a bad assignment previously, this can get as a way to upgrade you. If you've got four good assignments already, then there's no stress. You don't have to do this one more if you want. Um, and all, for those of you, and there are some of you who didn't hand in a previous assignment, so this is one way to cancel out that, that lack of assignments. Um, so I'm considering that at the moment. I, I probably will go through with it unless I get any serious objections. Um, so, but the, the due date for it will not be changed. That, that thing has to stay where it is. Because if I keep moving that forward, then we're going to run out of time. Okay, so, so just so you're aware of the assignment five, I want to have it at the assignment so you see that material and you get some practice on it. I don't want to cancel assignment five, but um, I also just want to make it so that for those of you who feel comfortable with the material, you don't have the stress of handling it. Okay, so let's take a look at where we were yesterday. We said we were going to look at modeling the equilibrium of the system in the absorption in the solar bed. And we're going to look in particular at pathways. So the, the, the following is, is a picture that you should have in your mind. We have diffusion of the adsorbated bulk fluid. So here's my bulk fluid and adsorbate coming in. Species that are interested in removing. So there's a diffusion of these adsorbate molecules, whatever they might be, ethanol or water molecules that we wish to remove. And this molecule is diffusing in the bulk of the, the fluid. There's a boundary layer around this adsorb it, that this molecule has to diffuse through. So some, some layer delta, lowercase delta, that, that molecule has to diffuse through. So there's the diffusion in the bulk fluid, there's diffusion of that molecule through the uh, boundary layer, and then there's this molecule has to come through the pore. So I thought we drawn it a bit too big here. Um, <coughs> relatively speaking, and this molecule has to come and diffuse into the pore and enter the adsorbent itself. So this adsorbent is an incredibly porous uh, structure. I just illustrated one particular pore here. We're not going to look at the diffusion modeling right now. I mean, essentially, what we're saying is that the, that molecule moving through the bulk fluid, through the boundary layer, and then into the pore itself, that's going to happen. It may just take some time, but that diffusion will happen. In many cases, that's not the rate limiting step. Um, the rate limiting step might be, well, sorry, it might be the rate limiting step, but we're going to give it enough time to occur. What we're going to be interested in the modeling is the concentration of these adsorbed particles here on the surface. So I'm going to get several particles absorbing about here in these pores. I'm interested in that concentration, which I'm going to call concentration of the adsorbate on the surface, CAS, relative to the concentration of CA in the bulk fluid. So those are the two concentrations I'm concerned with. And I'm going to aim at constructing a relationship between CA in the bulk and CAS on the surface. 
And the units for these are, are, are different because they're both concentrations, but they have different units. This first one is kilograms of adsorbate per as kilogram of adsorbate. And the units down here of CA are kilograms of adsorbate per meter cube of fluid. Okay, so this is in your slides as well. Not this illustration, but uh, those units are. So we're interested in, in, in developing that, that relationship. <coughs> CA is easy to measure. We can easily measure the concentrate concentration of the adsorbate in the fluid. So if this was a liquid system, I can usually put this through the spectrophotometer and measure the concentration based on the calibrated standard. If it's a gas system, it's a partial pressure. Um, I can measure that as a gas chromatograph related to the concentration. So, so either one of these two, liquid or, or solid or gas system, I can measure the CA. Easy to measure. The CAS is not easy to measure. We'll talk about how we might go about that. So, what we're going to do then is we we want to understand this relationship because ultimately we can then calculate how much adsorbent is required. And the way we do that is once I know this relationship between CAS and CA, let's say it might be of this form like this. I can measure CA. I can come back and calculate CAS. I know how much adsorbate I'm sending into the system, and then I can calculate the kilograms of adsorbent. Required. So the reasoning for these isotherms is so that we can eventually estimate how much resources is required. Okay, now these isotherms, we, we, we mentioned this term yesterday, it's a plot like shown over there which relates the amount of adsorbate on the adsorbent, CAS, to the concentration of adsorbents in the bulk. Adsorbates in the bulk, CA. And that plot is generated at a fixed temperature. If I change the temperature of the system, that curve shifts. So that's, that's the reason for its name, isotherm. And we ended off the class yesterday by talking about the simplest form of that relationship, which is a linear relationship. However, it, it applies actually for many systems at low concentrations. I'll show you how that happens in a minute. So this is a good model to have, um, but it, it's not valid over all ranges of concentrations. So for example, in this illustration that I have up here, this linear model would apply in this region down here. So for dilute systems, the linear model would work well, but it would break down after a certain concentration. So for, for dilute systems, in that region, for example, the linear model would work great. And essentially, that relationship between CA in the bulk and CAS on the surface is essentially Henry's law that you've seen in your mass transfer courses before. And in fact, that constant K behaves in the same way as Henry's law in that it has the temperature dependence given by the Arrhenius <coughs> equation in it for many systems. Not always, but, but in many systems, K changes with temperature in the way our is more does. So, so it's a good it's a good initial model, but it, it breaks down. So what we're going to look at then is um, an alternative model that is purely empirical. It's by that I mean that someone's just given this equation and noted that many systems follow curved behavior as shown over the other plot. But there's no theoretical derivation for this relationship. And this empirical equation given up at the top there, constant K multiplied by the whole concentration raised to the power of 1 over N. Some textbooks will raise that to the power of just a, a, a number N, or some, some letter at the, at the thing, but then we're raising it to the power of 1 over N. Either way, it doesn't matter which, which, uh, which equation form you use, just be aware that you can see both in the textbooks. We still need to estimate that constant k, and we need to estimate that constant m in the, in the exponent of the um, 
and you do that by plotting log log plots. If I take the logs on both sides, and this is something we've done in the lab reports over and over, so we, we won't need to cover it here. You take the logs on both sides, though, and you get a system where your intercept is log of k and your slope is the one of the values. But the question is then, how would you set up a lab experiment to even calculate both that k and that exponent m? Because we cannot measure CAS. We, we're not able to measure the concentration of A on the surface. So one, one particular set of experiments one can run is the following. Actually, I asked the class yesterday to, to think about that. Did anyone come up with a set of experiments that they might propose to estimate those constants? So if we plot up our data, we, we don't know 
know yet exactly which line, which uh, is it going to be a linear, is it going to be foiling isotherm? We're going to I'll show you another isotherm in a minute. It could be any one of them, but then you're going to fit that model to the data and you use the model that best fits. Okay, so it's a it's a standard statistical test that you can do to find the best fit model. And then it's not saying that this is the way the system works. So it's not a cause and effect. It's essentially just saying here's a model that matches how the system behaves, and I then can use that that model in the future to design and scale my process. Okay, so so it's relatively straightforward to estimate these isotherms. The next isotherm we're going to look at, though, the Langley isotherm. I thought I'll just go through the derivation a little bit more carefully, rather than just put it up there. Um, Unfortunately, for example, if you're following this in Gene Coppolis' book on, I think the second page on adsorption, they just put the Langley isotherm and say, just use it. But let's rather take a look at how that isotherm is derived because it gives us some insight into what, um, what's going on in the system. So the, the Langley isotherm is derived based on a few, uh, some assumptions. It says that we have a uniform adsorbent surface available. So the solid surface onto which I'm adsorbing has multiple sites where the adsorbate can attach itself onto. So that's the assumption, the, the sites available. And every site is equally attractive. So there's no, there's no preference to how that adsorbent is, uh, is attracting the adsorbate molecules. Every site in the adsorbent, the adsorbent is equally, equally attractive. And we'll consider CT sites available. So there's CT locations, and it seems a little bit unusual that I'm using moles of sites per kilogram of adsorbent, but it really shouldn't be too unusual because the concept of a mole is simply just uh, the Avogadro's number. So yeah, I could count up the number of sites available as a number, divided by Avogadro's number, and I'm essentially getting moles of sites. So we're working with a mole of quantity, moles of sites per kilogram of adsorbent. That's, that's quite okay. Um, at the end, CT is going to disappear, so we don't really care too much about how we quantify it. Next, I also measure the number of vacant sites. So after the period of time that my adsorbent is being used, some of the sites are going to be filled up, but the balance are going to be vacant. So CV are the number of open sites available to be filled by the molecule. And the rate at which I fill those sites we expect to be proportional to the number of collisions that the adsorbent makes onto that site. So there's a number of adsorbent molecules going around here, diffusing through the pores, and there, the probability of that then attaching to that site is proportional to the number of sites available. So that's CV. And PA is the concentration of the adsorbate. So PA, I've used it in terms of its partial pressure, but we showed uh, last class that we can relate PA directly to CA. Um, so if you're working with a liquid system, PA, sorry, if you're working with a gas system, PA equals CA times RT. So we're comfortable with CA as a concentration, but we could also work with partial pressures in atmosphere. So either one of those could uh, work, uh, work well and represent the concentration of adsorbate multiplied by the number of vacant sites available and then the proportionality constant. So this is, we, we treat this as a reaction system. So it's coming back to the same concepts as the reactor design tools, where we have the rate constant multiplied by the number of, of material available. So the rate at which I adsorb is given by that equation. Now let's take a look at the rate by which we desorb because this is an equilibrium process. There's adsorption taking place, but there's also desorption taking place. And CAS then will call the number of sites occupied by A. So that can be moles of sites per kilogram of adsorbate. And assuming that every site attracts one molecule, um, we form only a single layer. So that's another key assumption of derivation. The surface of the adsorbent is only coated with a single layer of adsorbate particles, or adsorbate molecules. Whereas some of the other models assume bilayers or multiple layers forming, this we're only assuming a monolayer will form. 
So desorption, then, I will represent that with the rate constant k subscript minus a. So that's the rate at which I'm desorbing is proportional to the number of sites that have been occupied. Already. So CAS. So the net rate is the rate of adsorption minus the rate of desorption. And the equilibrium of those two will net out to be zero. That's what we're considering is the equilibrium relationship. So equilibrium that, that comes out to zero. Uh, for convenience though, let's just define the equilibrium constant capital A is the ratio of the two rate constants, so that's standard. Ka divided by K minus A. And here we see what in, in reaction form what's what we consider to be happening. We consider that A, my adsorbate, plus a site available S is reacting essentially to form a combination AS. And that's an equilibrium. So the reverse can equally happen and, and in fact does. So even at steady state at equilibrium, both mechanisms forward and backwards are happening. Let's think about that in terms of the heat release. We said yesterday that heat is being released every time um, adsorption occurs. So the forward reaction releases heat, the reverse reaction takes that heat, of, heat away. So at equilibrium, we can get an, uh, it's a constant temperature system. Okay, so if we just do some, the rest of it is just mathematical simplification. So what we say is, if I equate that, that, that first line up there and set it equal to zero, I can equate the two terms. The total number of sites, however, CT is equal to CD plus CAS, so the number of vacant sites plus the number of occupied sites. And that's my basic concept. <coughs> if uh, we're deriving this just for a single adsorbent, we have CAS. So one, one type of molecule adsorbing. But in some of the more complicated derivations, we'll have CAS adsorbing, and if we have a second bike species, we'll have CBS and CCS and, and other species of adsorbing. Then this, this modeling gets a bit more complicated, but it is perfectly valid to and doable to model it. So that in our case, we're just considering one species adsorbing CAS up there. So, the total number of sites available, CT, is vacant sites plus occupied sites. Substitute that in then, CV. Substitute that in and rearrange for CT minus CAS. Simplify that equation and solve it for CAS. So we're relating CAS then to CA. Or in, in this case, I've, I've done it in terms of partial pressure. So in terms of partial pressures, I get a constant up here, K1. I love the CA and CT together, get a K1 constant, and in my denominator, K2 constant. If I want to convert the uh, partial pressures over to concentrations, those constants just change the numeric form, but the structure of the equation remains the same. So for those of you in the bio area, you've seen this over and over. This is your standard Michaelis Menten structure. Um, so both of you guys have a good understanding of what this, what this plot looks like. Um, in terms of Estimating the parameters for it, though, uh, maybe you haven't done that so, so well in the plot. In the lab reports, you often linearize that system um, and then estimate those, those rate constants using, I guess, the line weaver work plot. That sounds familiar. Line weaver work plot. Okay, so that's just garbage. Don't do that. It's full, full of errors. Rather use something a little better. If you have to linearize it by hand, use the Higgy-Hofsky conversion of it. That's a, a good link that you can click on to read more about it. Or we'll use some good software to fit it in a nonlinear regression. Okay. So that way you don't, you don't tie up the errors from your lab measurements into errors in the estimates. The key, the key difference on the plot though from Fluenic isotherm is that we see this leveling off. And that makes, that makes intuitive sense. It says that as we increase our concentration of adsorbate coming in, we're not going to infinitely load up that adsorbent. Okay. The Freudic isotherm, that line keeps going up and up and up. The linear isotherm, the line keeps going up and up, the CA. That's clearly not feasible. As we raise the concentration of adsorbates coming in, we're not going to keep loading and loading up the adsorbent. There's a finite capacity on the adsorbent. Okay. So 
the Lagme isotherm works well over a wide range of concentrations because it has this built-in leveling off over, over at higher concentrations. Okay, so neither, uh, we've got now three options, linear, Freundic, Lagme isotherm. So the way to, to go about it is to, we said, we first perform our laboratory experiments to collect the data, then we postulate a model. I'm going to assume it's linear, I'm going to assume Freundic, or I'm going to assume Lagme. Um, well, there's actually several other isotherms available down here that you can read about in the literature that are get progressively more and more, more complicated. So the BET and Gibbs isotherm. So you've got several possibilities here now. Fit your data to those, to the model, and estimate the fit. If it's a reasonable fit, then go ahead and use the model. If not, pick another model and you iterate until you find a suitable model that works for you. And so, yeah, the BET isotherm is a good isotherm um, in the sense that it's, it's derived from a theoretical concept as well. So I've shown you the theoretical derivation for the Langmuir isotherm. The BET isotherm has a similar derivation, quite a bit more complicated, it's a bit more flexible, but interestingly, if you, there's a special case for the BET isotherm which recovers the Langmuir equation, so it, it, it's, it catches both of them. We'll, we'll stick for this for this uh, introduction to this topic to the simpler Langmuir isotherm and the isotherm. Those will, those will work well for us and, and do work well for many situations. Okay, so now let's now let's take a look more at, at how this process is used. For the vast majority of systems we have packed beds. And so it's important that we, we understand the packed bed system. There are fluidized bed options that we spoke about in last class and, and, and a few other options, batch systems. But for the vast majority of adsorptions, they take place in, in fixed, packed beds. So we've got my, my bed over here packed with an adsorbent and I'm feeding the material in at, at, the, at the entrance and the effluent CA, that CA refers to the concentration of adsorbent in the outlet. That's easily measurable. I can easily measure CA, as we said, either I can use a spectrophotometer or online gas chromatograph. CA, easy to measure. What's loading onto the bed over here, CAS, that's not easy to measure. Okay, I cannot go in and measure CAS, but if I have my isotherm for the parts of the bed that are in equilibrium, that's the key point, for only for the parts of the bed which are in equilibrium, I can relate CA to CAS. Parts of the bed which are not in equilibrium, I cannot relate those two. Okay, so the Langmuir isotherm, Freundic isotherm, those give us the relationships between what I'm measuring coming out in my effluent here, that's essentially the bulk concentration leaving. That can be related to the, the concentration on that adsorbent, provided I'm in equilibrium. So this is a this is a nice uh, illustration of what's going on. Uh, it's from a very old journal publication, and I'm surprised that it's not in any of the other textbooks. But it explains quite nicely what's going on in a packed bed over time. Let's take a look carefully here. First thing to notice: the left-hand plots are the distance along the packed bed, so length from zero length to the outlet length. The right-hand side plots are showing you the measured concentration of the adsorbent, CA, as a function of time, theta. Theta here is time, L is the length. So the plots on the left are related to length, plots on the right are related to time. So that's, that's the key difference. They're not both lengths. One is length, one is time. The other is that the plots on the left here are showing you the concentration of the adsorbent on the solid, on the on the sites that we can absorb. Plots on the right are showing you the measurement of the effluent. So that's a key key difference there. Two different plots with two different x-axes and two different y-axes. So we're getting a very complementary view of what's going on in this reaction in this, in this uh, pack bed over time. So we'll look at what happens when the system is clean. So I've regenerated the bed, my adsorbent is unloaded, it's ready to be used. There is some 
non-zero concentration of adsorbent on the solid already. So that dashed line is not it's just off zero. When I regenerate my bed, I never regenerate it perfectly. I spent a lot of energy and time regenerating my bed so that it had zero uh, <coughs> adsorbent on it. I would be spending too much time and too much money to get to that state. So we, we, we accept that I'm never going to have a perfectly regenerated bed. So there's a non-zero initial concentration of A on the solid. Leaving my, my reactor at the time, or sorry, my packed bed at the time, is also some almost zero, essentially below my detectable limit of adsorbent A. So we would regenerate our bed so that if I started it up again the next time, coming out of my bed right away, I'm getting essentially zero or close to zero adsorbent. That's why we're running the system. So we're removing that, that A. So this is at, at, at initial state. Now I turn on my feed. I'm introducing material at a known concentration in my feed. I'll call it CAF later on. We'll see that terminology come in. So my feed comes in at a, at a certain concentration, and I run my bed for some period of time, and I get to time theta. Let's take a look at what's happened here. After a certain period of time, the concentration of A on my solid for this first portion of the bed is at some equilibrium value, CAS substrate E. I cannot load more material onto that adsorbent. So CAS substrate E represents the most I can load onto that adsorbent. There's a finite amount that that can take up. And that's in the first portion of the bed over there. The rest of the bed, this what we call the wave front of CA. Yes. There's a wave that moves through the bed, has declining concentrations, so declining concentrations up to a point where essentially the concentration here at the outlet is free or essentially at the, the initial state of loading, so CAS, at time zero. So most of my downstream part of the bed is still unloaded. There's a portion up the front that's now fully loaded and at equilibrium. So this is at equilibrium, which is why the superscript E. And then there's a transition period, that wave, that wave front. We'll call this then the equilibrium zone. No more material can be loaded on. There's my mass transfer zone, the MTZ, mass transfer zone. And then the unused portion of the bed. So this wave front, MTZ, represents the declining concentration of the adsorbate on the adsorbent. And that wave front moves at the same velocity. So provided I'm keeping my inlet flow Q constant, so whatever I'm feeding the system with, if I keep that well, if I keep that constant and control it well, that NTZ wave front moves at the same velocity through the bed of, of the of the, of the system. Coming out of my bed is still essentially zero or close to zero or undetectable adsorbate. Because there's available capacity here in the bed, as long as I've got available capacity, I shouldn't see anything coming out. This part that's easy to measure, CA, nothing should be coming out. Let's keep going with time. What will happen is I'll reach a time called theta subscript B, the breakthrough time. So this is the time at which my concentration that I can measure at the outlet effluent just starts to rise up. So theta B, that particular point, that concentration that I hit is usually considered to be somewhere between 1 to 5% of the feed concentration in the absence of better information, or it's considered the limit at which I need to stop. So as long as, if I, let's say for example, I'm discharging this fluid, leaving the packed bed into the municipal system, theta B would be the time that I have to close my valve, because if I keep going, 
I'm going to start to increase the concentration of this pollutant or this undesirable um, adsorbent <coughs> is going to start to rise up and then leave in my effluent. And I don't want that happening. So theta B represents the time that this bed is useful. I've now reached the useful life of the bed. I have to close my inlet and stop the system and regenerate the pet bed. So strip off the adsorbent. Theta B is an important number. The breakthrough time represents the usable capacity. At theta B, what's, what's happening is I've now loaded up, if we look at my, my bed loading, quite a chunk of it has been used. So a big, a substantial portion, so that can be about 50 to 80 percent of it, depending on the how spread out that wavefront is. So most of the bed has been used. There's a portion of the bed at the tail end that's partially used. So there is a partial amount of adsorbent available that if I kept going would still load up material for me. And that's in fact what the next two illustrations show. I can keep going until the point theta s, which is called my stoichiometric point. Um, that's roughly the 50-50 point between what's coming in and what's coming out. And I'll talk a bit more about that. And then the final point is I reach the time theta equilibrium where essentially my entire bed is in equilibrium. What's coming out at the exit of my bed in the effluent is essentially what I'm putting in in my feed. Okay, so CAF, which is my feed concentration at the entrance to the bed, is now essentially coming out at the end. There's no more capacity to load up and sorbet on this bed. So three critical times occur. My breakpoint time, theta B, my stoichiometric time, theta S, and the equilibrium time, where any point beyond theta E, I'm essentially just, my pack bed has just become a pipe. I'm just passing material in and it comes right out again. Now, as I've said before, my isotherm applies only to the portions of the bed that are in equilibrium. So my relationship between CA on the, on the right and CAS on the left only applies, that isotherm only applies to the portions that are in equilibrium. Okay, so NTZ is the definition, it's my mass transfer zone where absorption takes place. Uh, the, it's S-shaped. If there were no mass transfer resistance, by that I mean if there was no issues related to diffusion and those time delays of loading adsorbent onto the bed, that wave front would be perfectly vertical. I would essentially run my bed, I'd get nothing coming out, nothing coming out, nothing coming out, and then suddenly I'd get stuff coming out because that is a perfectly vertical line if I had no mass transfer resistance. But we know from our fluid flow courses that we're going to get probably a somewhat parabolic profile set up in that, in that pack bed. There's going to be axial dispersion. Some molecules are going to move their head faster than others. There's going to be imperfect mixing. So all of those reasons lead to having a transfer zone, a mass transfer zone, uh, where adsorption takes place. Equilibrium, ice, uh, equilibrium zone is this upfront part where the isotherm applies and then breakthrough, as I've mentioned, is when you either, it's arbitrary, depending on, on how you, the, the system that you're working with and the company's policy is, the lower limit of detection coming up or whatever your maximum allowable value is. And if you don't know either of those, it's not given, you can assume I'm somewhere between 1 to 5 percent of my feed concentration. So the moment you reach a small 1 percent or 5 percent of what's coming in, now starts to leave, you can say I've, I've reached my breakthrough. Next um, is I've got two more slides, and then this example will actually take about 20 to 25 minutes. So there's no sense in starting the example today. What I will do is I'll introduce it and have you think about it, um, and then we'll just pick it up on the next class. So there's a few questions that are asked here. I give the answers and um, on the next few slides. So it's it's not a 
it's not like a question, question, but it's it. And it actually introduces a lot more theory. So I would like you to, to spend some time and go through that over uh, the weekend or prior to next class. But let's just, uh, to finish off then, talk about uh, regenerating the bed. So once I've loaded up the bed, I need to recover the adsorbent, sorry, I need to recover the adsorbate off the bed if I'm interested in it. I want to recover it and then, but mainly what I'm interested in is recovering that adsorbent so that I can use it for a second time around. Now there's several ways of doing this. Uh, one is called the temperature swing, and the other is called the pressure swing. There's a few other ways um, which, which use some combinations of those as well. Let's take a look at my isotherm. So here I'm plotting on my x-axis PA, but this could equally well be CA. So if you want to add that to your notes, CA or PA, either of those, um, I've got the concentration that's easily measurable coming out of my path.
what ends up happening is that that adsorbate leaves in this vapor steam. But essentially what we're doing is the adsorbate that I started off with that was mixed in my feed, I'm now removing it in steam. Okay, so you have to be careful here. With, if I require an excessive amount of steam, I'm essentially going to end up with my adsorbate now just in a, a steam vapor solution. Whereas initially I started off with it in some other solution. So you're essentially just changing from one medium to the other. And it may defeat the object of what you're trying to do. If you're trying to concentrate up your adsorbate, you may end up using so much steam that you essentially end up with more fluid or about the same amount of fluid that you started off with. Okay, so it, but it, it might be okay because separating your adsorbent from steam might actually be a lot easier than separating from the original fluid that was carried in the original. Okay, especially if you simply just take your steam adsorbent and you bubble it through water, you can, you can separate it out and if it's an organic, it, it may be immiscible with water and so it will, will split out in a second. So you can just put it through a mixer and then settle it out and easily recover your adsorbate. But you may not be able to recover it at the concentration you would like to. So steam has its drawbacks, or any, any de uh, regeneration has its drawbacks, that you may end up using so much uh, material to regenerate the bed that you essentially end up with a dilute mixture. Um, however, the advantage might be that this new, this new um, desorbent that you've used is, is relatively easier to separate than the original feed material. Um, some of the issues with steam are that it's obviously you're at high temperatures. If your adsorbate is solvent, um, you can be near flammable limits. And there's many examples of these beds catching fire, especially if it's a packed carbon bed. Um, so if you read a lot of the literature, there, there's always interesting case studies of, of companies that have kind of set fire to their beds after just starting them up like a few minutes. And a brand new bed and it just goes up in flames because they didn't do um, any, any understanding of the safety. So, so that is important. Um, there's the pressure swing that we, we can quickly talk about. The pressure swing allows you to recover the product. This is why we use in the oil and gas industry, actually. And why we, uh, for, not that any of you are emphysema patients, but if you were an emphysema patient and you carry a portable oxygen container around with you, it uses pressure swing absorption. Um, so essentially what you're doing is you're loading up the feed at high pressure. If I move to a lower pressure, I'm essentially moving along this curve, the same isotherm, but now to a, a lower concentration on my adsorbent. So simply by reducing the pressure down, and in some cases that amount of reduction of pressure might require you to be pulling a vacuum. Okay, so this is not necessarily cheap to, to do. Uh, this might require a significant amount of energy, so it's not that temperature swing versus the pressure swing is cheaper or more expensive, it's just that the pressure swing is, is a bit more practical. Temperature swing is I have to put in an incredible amount of energy, I have to heat my bed, that adsorbent may have a high heat capacity, so it will take a lot of steam before I actually reach the temperature. Secondly, I'm not only heating my bed, I'm also heating the carbon steel, stainless steel container that is the packed bed itself. So all of that energy that goes in can be quite excessive. With the pressure swing, I simply say, pull a vacuum and reduce your pressure down, and your adsorbate will start to desorb. Um, and so what you're always doing with these systems, whether it's temperature or pressure swing, you've always got one um, bed regenerating, and you may have, sorry, sometimes you have two or three beds regenerating, and only one ad adsorbing. Uh, so it's, you cycle between between beds. So if you look at these flow sheets, there's always multiple beds and a whole se sequence of valves, and you're simply just rotating around, adsorbing and desorbing. Okay, so why are you used in, uh, for oxygen generation, H2S capture in, in petroleum refineries? As you would imagine, that pressure swing absorption really only applies to uh, gas phase type systems. So it wouldn't work in liquid phase systems. Okay, so next class we'll take a look through that example. Uh, please take a look at it, go ahead and find some important concepts there that will be a lot easier.